Well, thanks for having me back. I, uh, I hope I remember how to do this. It's been a while since I've been here. Oh, I got just a... So, yep, I should start with, yes, the name of the, of the show is Freshwater Whales. I know I'm a history teacher by profession. I promise I did pass science class, and I know there's no whales in the Great Lakes. So hopefully no one blasts me in the comments on your YouTube channel later for saying there's whales in the Lake Great Lakes. That's not the point of the title. Um, so freshwater whales is a really interesting story. There's a very unique, very unique class of boat uh, that was built here on the Great Lakes, known as whalebacks, or as its detractors called it, the pig boat. And this is the front of one right here, and you can see how it, uh, if you don't like this uh, particular style of boat, you can see how it kind of resembles a pig snout. So it was really kind of a, a uh, derogatory nickname to call it a pig boat, but a little bit about the uh, the designer of these things. Alexander McDougall. He's born on an island off the coast of Scotland in 1845, and they, his family immigrates to Canada in 1854, where they settle by Collingwood, Ontario. And he is immersed into the Great Lakes shipping community. Uh, he ends up in 1861, he leaves a apprenticeship under a blacksmith, and he goes sailing. He starts as a deckhand. And he works his way up to being captain. And then he decides to try his hand at shipbuilding, despite the fact that his formal education stopped at seventh grade. And the reason he got into shipbuilding is as a captain, during his era in the, in the mid to late 1800s, it was very common for steamers to tow barges. So they could pull, you know, they could haul extra cargo with one engine. And what he noticed on traditional steamers pulling traditional barges, which were typically schooners that had had their masts cut down. When he got into any kind of weather, they tended to what we call yaw, and that barge would start swaying side to side, and that puts extra strain on that towing hawser and causes all sorts of problems. So McDougall started wondering, there's gotta be a better way to design a barge that's gonna be towed behind a powered vessel what he comes up with is what becomes known as the whaleback. And you can tell by its design, it is unusual. It is designed to sit very low in the water. You see those rounded sides. The whole concept of the whaleback was that waves could roll over the deck and back off the deck. And it really wouldn't, in essence, the vessel would go through a wave instead of over it. Hopefully, the idea there being that it would travel more on a straight line behind its, the ship that's towing it. And so it is a, a really unique uh, design. And so he's going to start with a barge. But first, before you actually get into building a ship, you have to have money and you have to have a place to build it. McDougal had neither. So... He's going to start his own shipyard. Now, this is a later picture in Superior, Wisconsin. You can see there's clearly multiple vessels being built at once here. Uh, but what he's going to do, he goes he goes out east. He talks to the major, major industrialists of the era, and no one is really interested in his idea. They all look at his plans, and the basic idea is there's no way that thing is going to float. So he really struggles to get financing, and he ends up, selling shares in the first vessel he's going to make in order to raise the money uh, to start a, uh, a shipyard in Superior, Wisconsin. And that's kind of the talk of the town. When you start going through the newspapers uh, from Duluth and Superior, they're kind of, that's a big shipping town. They know ships. They know Great Lakes shipping. They're really curious about just what is this monstrosity that McDougal is building because it doesn't look like anything they've ever seen before. Uh, they call it a cigar boat at some times. And as the first one starts to be built, um, they start having more and more questions. And the very first one he builds is a barge, just like he originally 
uh, planned on to be towed behind a conventional Great Lakes steamer. And it's going to have the very original name of Barge 101. So we get to June 22nd, 1888, and it is launch day for the very first whaleback. And the whole town shows up. Everyone's here to watch this, uh, this cigar-shaped thing drop in the water. I think most of them were wondering if it would actually float when it hit the water. It did. And allegedly, this is what is reported. I don't know if it's true or not, but sometimes you have to just go with the legend. When Barge 101, Alexander McDougall's dream hits the water, his wife is there with him, and reportedly her first words are what every supportive spouse should say, there goes our last dollar. Well, Barge 101 did in fact float, and it went to work pretty quickly. Over the next decade, Alexander McDougall's dream is going to grow. Uh, he will be building barges. And as far as the total number that are built, I'm going to say somewhere between 40 and 44. It kind of depends on the source that you look at. The last couple had some alterations to them. So some people don't count them as whalebacks. Some do. So there's a little bit of a discrepancy on exactly how many we attribute to the whaleback class. He starts with barges. And then he moves into whalebacks that are steamers themselves. He's going to build several of those. And one of them is going to be built especially for the Chicago World Fair. And it's going to be the one and only whaleback passenger ship ever built. This is the Christopher Columbus. So the whaleback design expands beyond just tow barges. But as a... As a shipwreck story presenter, I know what side my bread is buttered on, and you are not here to learn about boats that kept floating. So let's talk Barge 104 for a second. So on November 10th, 1898, the whaleback steamer Frank Rockefeller arrives just off the Cleveland breakwater, and it's kind of choppy weather. There's a storm rising. And it drops its anchor. He's supposed to wait there because Barge 104 is going to be pulled out by a tugboat where he will be posited up to the Rockefeller and they're on their way north to Two Harbors. So, like I said, the storm is rising. And as the barge is coming through the break wall, wouldn't you know it, the storm breaks the towing hawser. And so now you have a loose barge between the break walls of Cleveland and it's unsecured. You can probably imagine how that's going to end up. And Barge 104 is going to get smashed up against the breakwater in Cleveland before it even gets out into the open lake. It's kind of a dramatic moment. This barge is getting pounded to pieces uh, by this storm. There are men on the barge. So even though it's an unpowered vessel, even though it's supposed to be towed by a steamer, there is still a crew on board the barge and they are in serious trouble. Uh, but the coast, or excuse me, the uh, life saving station is right there, and they are going to do everything they can to get these guys. And you've heard me talk about the life saving service before, and these guys are good at what they do. They do get out there in a rowboat to go rescue these guys, and they wind up climbing up on the break wall. They row out there in their boat, and they they climb up on the break wall. They get these guys off the barge, and they turn around and their rowboat is gone. So now, uh, yes, the lifesavers did rescue the crew of the barge. Now they all need rescuing themselves. Fortunately, the tug that had lost the barge was still in the air and they were able to get everybody off and there's no casualties on, the, on barge 104. And the story gets a bit more interesting. It's right at the breakwater, right? So this should be an easy, easy task to patch it up, refloat it, put it back into service. So when the storm abates, people go out there. Where's the barge? They can't find it. And so tugboats go out there. They start uh, dragging the bottom, trying to find it. 
And it's a couple days before they find a 100 plus foot steel barge that wrecked on the break wall. Shouldn't have been that hard to find, but if you know anything about Lake Erie, the bottom of that lake is very different than the other lakes. Um, I've heard it called quicksand. I've heard it called muck. Bottom line is things sink in the bottom of Lake Erie. And so they finally do locate it. One of the pieces of the superstructure was sticking up from the bottom of the lake. So what they discovered is not only did the barge sink in the water, it sank in the bottom. It sank in the quicksand right off the breakwater. It's still there. They weren't able to salvage it. It had uh, been buried under way too much silt. So somewhere under the sand of the Cleveland breakwater is barge 104. They were not able to raise it. So that's the first whale back to be lost. Then we move forward to barge 115. I tell you, putting this, this talk together almost felt like math class. There was a lot of numbers involved here. So for a history guy, that was difficult for me. I hope I got them all straight. Barge 115 is an incredible story. So on December 13th, 1899, She's being towed by the whaleback steamer, the Colgate Hoyt, and they're going to be going across Lake Superior, headed for a Lake Erie port. Now, they're, they're working through a storm. It's, it's not too bad when they start, but as anyone who's ever been on the lakes knows, storms have a habit of getting worse at the absolute worst time. And so they're out here uh, kind of off the Keweenaw, just kind of an, on a northerly track, and that storm gets worse. And a common theme with any vessel that's being towed is tow lines like to break. And this one did as well. So the towing hawser breaks, barge 115 gets drifted off into the storm. Now the captain of the Colgate Hoyt is a pretty brave soul. He actually turns his ship around in the middle of a storm and he spends four hours looking for this barge and he can't find it. Eventually, he has to call off the search because he's running out of coal to feed his boilers. He's at risk of running out of fuel, and so his engines would stop, and that's not a good place to be in the middle of a storm. So he's forced after four hours, he's forced to call off the search, and he, go, he continues on to the Sioux where he re, uh, refuels with coal, and he hires a tugboat to come back with him and recontinue the search. He returns to the scene looking for barge 115. No one is able to find it. And so after a couple days of searching, Barge 115 is given up as lost. And the nine men that were crewing her are also assumed lost. That is, until they turned up alive. Here's where the story gets really incredible. So you have an unpowered barge. Remember, this thing does not have an engine. This is not a cut down schooner, so they can't even really put up an emergency sail. There's really nothing for these guys to do to try to control their vessel in any way. They drifted for a couple of days in Lake Superior in December in a storm. And eventually they end up going aground on Pick Island along the North shore of Lake Superior. And they're able to use the barges life raft to get ashore to get to the island now they're still on an island that's still not a great place to be in december in bad weather but wouldn't you know it they find an abandoned hunting shack when they get on shore so they have shelter they can get out of the elements a little bit they wait for the next day and that's when they have that's when they realize they're on an island at first they thought they were on the mainland the next day they start walking and they get to the other side of the island, realize they have more problems. They go back and they tear down the hunting shack and make a raft and they float the raft to the mainland in the middle of the woods. So they start walking through the woods. They get to the next night. They still have not found a town. So they end up camping overnight in the woods in December in Canada, continue walking 
for a second day until they find railroad tracks. They start following the railroad tracks and eventually they come stumbling into Marathon, Ontario and start telling people that they're the crew of Barge 115 that had been given up as dead days earlier. Not a single person was lost from Barge 115. Through all of that, they, had, they were cold, they had some frostbite, but they all survived. But ultimately, uh, Barge 115 was not able to be salvaged either. The pounding on the rocks on Pick Island just kept it right there. Finally, we get, to a, we get to a boat that has a name. I'm gonna give you a break from the numbers. We're not done with them, they'll be back, but we have, we have a boat that has a name, the Sagamore, and it's a, also a barge. So July 26, 1901, we've crossed over into the 1900s now. Um, the whaleback steamer Pathfinder is towing the Sagamore and they are heading down the lake. And I promise, this story is a little bit different. The tow hawser does not break. <laughs> However, when they get closer to the Sioux, everyone's favorite fog. And it's very thick fog. So the captain of the Pathfinder, when he passes Whitefish Point, he uses the fog signal from the lighthouse to navigate from, to, to calculate his position. It is a blinding fog. So he is navigating by sound. And so he takes a fix on the fog signal at Whitefish Point. He calculates uh, where he needs to be, and he, he charts his course and goes on from there. As he gets off Point Iroquois, he decides it's best to lay up until the fog clears because he's heading, he's getting closer to the St. Mary's River, and it's just way too thick for anyone to be able to navigate in close quarters. So he, he drops anchor, and... He, uh, he shortens the tow hawser because he still has the Sagamore behind him. So he signals for the Sagamore to drop its anchor as well. And he made, he made one mistake. So at this point in history, um, if you're an anchor in the fog, you ring a bell. That's your fog signal. So any vessel that's passing by knows that you are there. Now, the Pathfinder and the Sagamore both had bells. And he told the barge to not ring theirs because what he was afraid of is he was afraid that anyone trying to get through in the fog would think it was two steamers and might accidentally navigate between his ship and the barge. So only the, only the steamer is ringing a fog signal. At the same time, while he's making all these decisions, the steamer Northern Queen is locking up through the suit. Now, I told you it was very thick fog, and the captain of the Pathfinder is navigating on sound, only sound. He's made a mistake. What he doesn't know is that he has inadvertently anchored his steamer and the barge Sagamore directly in the upbound lane coming out of the Sioux. He's not out of the way like he thinks he is. So as the Northern Queen comes out of the Sioux and is heading upbound, he ends up slamming right into the Sagamore punching a hole in the side of the barge, the barge actually sinks in one and a half minutes. There is very little time for these men to uh, abandon ship, and yet most of them do. Ultimately, only two lives, the captain and the cook of the barge will be lost. The others will be rescued, but the Sagamore is going to go down very quickly. Initially, it was reported that it was a collision between two ships that were underway in the fog and there were, you know, mistakes made. Later on, it comes out that, no, the Sagamore was at anchor. So that makes the Northern Queen look really bad in this particular case. And I told you that two people were lost in this one, the captain and the steward or the, the cook. Um, they were both recovered in the days uh, following. And the Sagamore was just too damaged. Um, She's still on the bottom off of Point Iroquois. And fittingly for her story, people do dive on the wreck, but they have to be careful because the wreck is in the upbound freighter track. So the divers have to keep someone on their boat to move it in case one of those big thousand footers comes along.
later on the same year, it's not a barge this time. Now we're to one of the steamers, the Thomas Wilson. It's June 7th of 1902, and he's up in Duluth. He's loaded iron ore. And it's a, it's a bright, clear summer day. It's calm. There is no storm of any kind. And so uh, Captain Cameron actually departs Duluth with his deck crew still out dogging down his hatches. And that's, in good weather, that's not unusual, right? There's, there's really no reason to stay at the dock while your, your guys are out putting all the clamps down on the hatches. To get out of Duluth, though, you have to pass through the ship canal, which is a very narrow space. So any ship on its way out really only has one place to go. You have to go right out those piers. And it's going to take a while before you can get to where you can maneuver. And so as the Thomas Wilson steams out of Duluth, the deck crew is out putting the hatches on. And here's the scenario. So the Thomas Wilson is heading out and he looks up. Captain Cameron looks out his pilot house windows and he sees the George G. Hadley coming inbound. It's a wooden steamer. He sees them, and he assumes a port-to-port -port or left-side-to-left-side -left -side passing, which would be standard. And so far, everything is as it should be. But there's a third boat that's involved here, and it's a tugboat. This is long before ship-to-ship -ship communication, so the two captains cannot talk to each other on a radio. And also, company offices cannot call the boat and tell them that there's a change of orders. So a tugboat comes out to the Hadley and tells Captain Fitzgerald that instead of going to Duluth, we need you to divert and come down here to the superior entry. So Captain Fitzgerald acknowledges the change of orders and he tells, he looks out, thinks he's clear. Now, if you've ever been to Duluth, it's a, it's a very, it's a city that's built into a hillside. So it's a very busy background. And if you remember the uh, first picture that I showed you, those whalebacks, when they're loaded, they sit very, very low to the, you know, in the water. And you have all these buildings and all these ore docks as a backdrop. And Captain Fitzgerald did not see the Wilson. And so he knows he has to come to port. He knows he has to turn left to get to the superior entry. And he turns left directly into the side of the Thomas Wilson. Clear day, no storm, no fog. He simply didn't see the other boat. And as the Wilson starts sinking, it's immediately apparent that it is going to sink. There is no saving the ship. And remember those hatches that they were still dogging down? As the ship sinks, they are going to let more and more water in, and the Wilson is going to sink in a matter of minutes. Um, as it goes down, guys, obviously just jump into the water at this point. This is only one mile from the end of the Duluth Piers. This is very close to shore. This is not uh, out very far at all. And the sailors on the Hadley are throwing anything that will float overboard to these guys. Uh, they're trying to haul them aboard as well. I think it's 11 guys that they managed to pull aboard the Hadley. The Hadley stays on scene as long as they can. And then Captain Fitzgerald decides that um, he needs to he needs to bring the Hadley in for inspection. And it's probably a good thing he had that decision when he did, because as he's heading into, into the superior entry or heading over there, the Hadley begins to sink. And so he has to make a quick turn and run it up on shore where the Hadley is going to sink right there. And the poor survivors of the Wilson have now survived their second shipwreck in half an hour. At this point, I think I'd consider a career change. Unfortunately, not everyone got off the Wilson. There are nine men that go down with the Thomas Wilson one mile from shore. There's obviously an inquiry about this one. You can't have two ships run into each other with, for no obvious reason without an inquiry. How do two ships in clear weather collide? So as a result of the inquiry, they do find fault with both captains, but one captain takes most of the blame. So Captain Fitzgerald 
of the Hadley, the one that turned into the Wilson, has his license completely revoked. He will not sail again. And Captain Cameron of the Wilson has his license suspended for 60 days because they said he could have done a little bit more to be careful with a known approaching vessel. Basically, what they said is he should have been, he sh to use a driving terminology, he should have been driving for the other driver. He should have, he should have been aware that a mistake could potentially be in the making, um, but they didn't hold him uh, very responsible at all. His his bosses thought that was not a good ruling, and they came right out and said, "That's fine. Captain Cameron will sail his first mate on another vessel at captain's pay." They did not believe that their their captain should have been disciplined whatsoever, and they took care of Captain Cameron. Um, he's going to get his license back, like I said, in 60 days. And then there's some legal drama. So Captain Fitzgerald is going to appeal the revocation of his license. He wants it back. He will lose that appeal. And uh, so if he wants to sail again, and he, he ultimately tells friends that he's going to retire, he is of an age where he can retire because in order to get his license back, he not only would have to take the exam for a master, he would have to take all exams from the lowest seaman up to master. And so he said, you know what? I'm old enough to retire. I'm just done. And so, yes, the, uh, the Thomas Wilson was also not salvaged. She's still on the bottom, about one mile out from the Duluth Pierce. And they did, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I believe they had to uh, dynamite a little bit of that wreck to get it deep enough so incoming and outgoing ships won't hit it. But it is still at the bottom, just off Duluth. Sorry, we're back to numbers. Barge 129. So Barge 129, October 13th, 1902, is being pulled by the steamer Mauna Loa, and you will notice that this one is not a whaleback. Just because a barge was a whaleback did not mean that it had to be towed by a whaleback steamer. So it's being towed by the Mauna Loa, and they are heading down Lake Superior. They get in a storm. Sorry, I sounded like a broken record, but the towing hawser broke right off uh, Vermilion Point. Now, the captain of the Mauna Loa is, he's a brave dude. You have a free-floating steel barge, 300-some feet long, in a Lake Superior storm. Not only is he going to turn his ship around in that storm, he's going to try to re-hook up to this barge. But if you think about it, what choices does he have? You try, or you, you abandon a barge and its crew to almost certain loss. So he's going to turn around. He's going to try to reattach a line to this barge. And as they come closer, you've got his crew are on the stern of the Mauna Loa. You've got the crew of the barge are up on the bow. They've got this hawser ready. They're trying to get it reattached. And they collide. And so the Mauna Loa punches a big hole in the barge. It starts to sink. And so amazingly, in the middle of a storm, the crew of barge 129 is able to lower their wooden y'all boat and row to the Mauna Loa and everyone is saved. I'm not sure how you launch a wooden y'all boat in a Lake Superior store, much less row one, but they did it. And so no one, no one's lost on barge 129 and barge 129. Her story is not quite done because we just recently got the rest of the story. She was in the news not that long ago. So the Great Lakes Shipwreck Historical Society they're really cool folks. They go out every summer looking for missing ships. And in 2021, they got this sonar image. And that looked really, really familiar. But sonar images can be deceiving. I talked with a guy once that was convinced that they had found one of the uh, ships that's still missing from the big 1913 storm. They dove down and found a limestone shelf. So sonar images can be deceiving. So... It's going to take video evidence. 
So they go back the next year. This time they're taking their ROV for the 600 foot dive to go see what's down there. And the initial images are looking promising. It's clearly a, a steel vessel that almost looks like one of those turret housings uh, that's on a whale back, but there's nothing definitive here. But as they're flying the ROV along, lo and behold, there's that very distinctive pig nose. And so in 2022, Barge 129 is seen for the first time in 120 years, and she was the last missing whaleback. All of the whalebacks that went down on the Great Lakes have been accounted for, and we know where they are at now. Then we go to the James B. Colgate. We're skipping forward to 1916, and it's October 20th. When the Colgate is going to leave Buffalo, New York, under the command of Captain Walter Grashaw. Now, Grashaw is no stranger to, to the Colgate. He has been her first mate for years. This is his very first trip as her captain. He finally got his license. He's been promoted, and he's now captain of the Colgate. And when he leaves Buffalo, it's about a five-foot chop which especially for a loaded whaleback is not that much. They can handle that pretty well. But again, storms on the Great Lakes have a bad habit of getting worse. And as he's coming across Lake Erie, this storm is going to increase in velocity until about six o'clock in the evening when the winds are roaring at 75 miles an hour. And by eight o'clock in the evening, the crew notices that the Colgate is just doesn't feel right under their feet. It has a list and it's answering its rudder rather sluggishly. So Captain Grashaw turns on the spotlight and what he sees is what no one wants to see while at sea. The bow of, the, of that vessel is getting lower in the water. It's taking on water somewhere. It's listing to the bow. It's nosing deeper into these waves than it should. And the hatches, as it's pitching and rolling, the hatch covers are rising and falling from the force of the water sloshing around inside the boat. 75 mile an hour gale, no one is going out on that deck to fix or re-dog down those hatches. There is nothing humanly possible to do other than hang on and hope your boat floats long enough to get you to shore somewhere. The coal gate won't make it. At about 10 o'clock in the evening, she's going to nose into a wave and disappear. The entire crew is thrown into the water. Captain Grashaw and two other men make it to a life raft that's, that's floating in the water. So three guys get to a raft. Everyone else is lost immediately. Over the course of the evening, the other two men are lost overboard on the raft. They're washed away one by one until only Captain Grashaw is left on the raft. And he spends the entire night, he makes it to the morning of the 21st the, at sunrise. No help shows up. He's going to spend all day on the 21st and the night of the 21st alone on the raft in October. Cold, wet, and freezing. You get to the 22nd, the morning of the 22nd, he looks up and he sees a boat and it's going to be the passenger steamer, the city of Detroit. Now keep in mind, Captain Grashaw has been out in the elements on this raft for a day and a half. He's pretty well frozen. He does everything he can to try to signal this boat. He, he can barely move. He's so cold. And the city of Detroit doesn't see him. And it sails right past him. So he's survived all this time to come that close to rescue to watch it sail away. He, he actually said at that point, he almost thought about just letting go of the raft and being done with it. But what he didn't know is another ship had seen him at the same time. And the big car ferry, the Marquette and Bessemer number two, number two. It is the second car ferry on Lake Erie to bear that name. They did see him, and they changed course immediately and came and got him. 
And by the time they pull him up on the car ferry, Captain Grashaw had been on that raft for 34 hours. And he survived. And in a complete turnaround from traditional maritime law, the captain didn't go down with his ship. The captain became the only survivor. In a unique twist, in this particular storm, two other ships were lost on Lake Erie, and another one had only the captain survive. So Lake Erie was not following tradition that day. The Clifton is an interesting one, because this, this one actually involves Alpina a little bit. So September 20th of 1924, the Clifton is loading 2,200 tons of crushed stone at Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin, bound for Detroit. Now, if you look at the Clifton here, it looks different than any other picture I've shown you so far. You'll notice that it looks very similar to boats you might see on the lakes today. She has a self-unloading boom. It's pretty new technology in 1924. It's really just getting started on the Great Lakes, but she has one and she's bound for Detroit. And as she comes around the tip of the mitten, a storm comes up, but she's going to plow into it anyway on her way up. And the next day, just off 40 mile point, she's sighted by the wrecking tug, the favorite. And there's really the, the captain of the favorite notices her. He says he notes in his logbook that she was taking some pretty big waves over her bow. She, and in his words, was making heavy weather of it, but he said she she seemed to be handling it okay. He didn't see anything necessarily wrong. And more importantly, he did not observe any distress signals. So he, he carries on uh, with his own route. But as you probably can guess, the Clifton was never seen again. When she's initially reported overdue at Detroit, the Coast Guard obviously starts looking and almost immediately there is a report that she had put in at Oscoda to get in out of the weather. Unfortunately, that proved to be false. She was not. They even sent airplanes out. Airplanes are covering Lake Huron looking for, for the lost Clifton, and they can't find it. Then the wreckage. Proof that the Clifton had gone down is found uh, just off Thunder Bay Island when a door that reads Clifton is recovered. And on the other side of the lake, off of Canada, they pick up a big chunk of the Clifton's pilot house and the ship's clock had stopped at 4 p.m. giving us an idea of roughly when the ship went down. And then finally, if they needed any more proof, just off Thunder Bay Island, the first body of the Clifton crew is located. No one will survive the loss of the Clifton. And people look for a long time the Clifton was one of the last ones to be found. Not the last, but one of the last ones. It's going to take all the way to 2017. David Trotter is probably the premier shipwreck hunter in Great Lakes history. I don't even want to try to think about how many wrecks he's found. Uh, but 2017, his, his team went and investigated a sonar hit, and they found a whale back. Now, why couldn't they find the Clifton sooner? He found it almost 100 miles from where people thought it had sank. Uh, interestingly, a lot of people at the time had theorized that it was that self-unloading boom had been the cause of her loss, that it made her top-heavy, that she would have rolled over in the seas. Uh, it, you can kind of tell in this picture, but the Clifton is lying completely on her side, and the unloading boom is still sitting in its saddle with the stays on. So... That wasn't the reason why. I have not heard yet if they've actually um, figured out what, what precisely caused the Clifton to go down. But for all intents and purposes, it just got beat to death by the storm. And then the last, the last story I have for you, I'm kind of glad, I, I put these all in, in uh, chronological order. And I'm glad that the Henry Court comes last because it is, it's a fitting story to end with because the court is just a bad luck boat. Some boats you just don't want to be on, and the court's one of them. So we need to back up to December 18th, 1917. For the first time, the court sank. 
She had a habit of sinking. So it's 1917, and the Henry Court is working its way down the Detroit River in ice. And they have some issues with the ice down there with another boat. And the freighter Midvale winds up running into it and sinking the Henry Court. Just off Bar Point in Lake Erie. Shallow water. So uh, it's December. The lakes are quickly freezing over. So they just leave it right where it is. And they're going to go recover it in the spring. They're not going to be able to salvage it before the ice freezes over top of the wreck. So they're going to leave it for spring. Well, the next spring, they go out there. Where's the court? They can't find it. They, they quite literally offer a reward to anyone who can find the sunken boat that they knew where it was last fall. They did find it. They put a lighted gas buoy over it so they wouldn't lose it a second time. The court just wants to be difficult, no matter whether it's floating or not, because, okay, they found it. They put a buoy over it. We should be good. Nah, fast forward to September. The J.H. McLean runs into it while it's still sunk. I'm not sure if that's the court's fault. I mean, the thing had a buoy on it, but... Uh, the steamer J.H. McLean runs into it only a couple weeks before they got it refloated. So they refloat it. They put the court back into service. A year or two later, it runs aground in almost the same spot that it had been sunk before. So uh, we get to 1927. The court is sold, and she looks a bit different now. She's uh, She's been given two whirly cranes on her deck because her new in her new life, it's her job to haul pig iron. So she's got these two cranes on her now to help her load and unload her cargoes. And she is successful in that, that role for a number of years. Then we get to November 30th, 1934. And Captain Cox takes the uh, Henry Court out of uh, Holland, Michigan, bound for Chicago. And he gets almost across the lake when a storm hits. And... It hits about one o'clock in the afternoon and the court is having a tough go of it. It's straight on his nose. He's having a hard time making any sort of headway. And at two 30 in the afternoon, the storm decided that the court was not going to go to Chicago and it just spun the boat around and sent it the other way. Not the captain's decision. It was the storm's decision. Captain Cox realizes he's not going to be able to turn back around into the storm. So he just plots a course for Muskegon. Says, if the storm wants me to go this way, I'm going to go that way. Well, by the time he gets back to Muskegon, the storm has not let up. So he has a problem. He's pretty sure his anchors won't hold. There's really no place to anchor right there. So he's going to have to try to sail through the breakwaters of Muskegon in heavy weather. Not an easy task to do. He won't make it. As he starts going into, in between the piers at Muskegon, as a wave comes up underneath the boat, moves it 150 feet to port and slams it into the break wall. And then the ship spins around so it's lying parallel against the break wall. Easy, easy to get help for this one because the Coast Guard station is 3,000 feet away from the wreck. And the lookout watched it the break wall there it was a storm so they had a lookout obviously on duty he watched this happen he rings the alarm and they go out with their 36 foot motor lifeboat immediately so this should be uh, the, you know these guys on the court shouldn't be waiting long for help the problem is the storm is so strong that it's giving it's giving that motor lifeboat everything it can handle and the coast guard guys are having a real problem uh because a couple of them got washed out of the boat. And so the guy in charge there turns the boat around. They, the couple guys that get washed overboard, they grab them and they pull them back into the boat. They hustled out there because initially they thought everyone on the court was going to be lost. Um, the initial reports were that everyone on board uh, was lost. The Coast Guard guys, they get the two guys that wash overboard out of the, out of the lifeboat. They get those guys back in. They turn around, and there's someone else missing. 
the Coast Guard will lose one man in the attempted rescue of the crew of the court. And to make matters worse, it was a 23-year-old named Jack Dipert who was making his first rescue. He was a brand new recruit to the Coast Guard. This was his first real life rescue and he won't survive. Fortunately though, the initial reports were wrong. No one on the court is lost when it crashes into the break wall, but they're still on board. So the, the Coast Guard lifeboat couldn't get out to them. They go back to the station, they start coming up with plan B. How are we gonna get there? And you can see, I love this picture of the court right here. This is looking down the break wall. And by, this is a later picture, so the storm is obviously abating quite a bit. They go out there. The Coast Guard goes out the next day. They're not going to leave them. They wait till daybreak, and they go get these guys. But they don't go in their, in their boat. They walk out the break wall. Waves are still coming up over it. They're going to walk out that break wall and go get these guys. And how do they keep everybody safe? They tie themselves to each other. They get a big, long piece of rope, and they tie it around each other's waist. So if one guy gets washed off the break wall, everyone else can pull him back. And they go walking out to the court. They get these guys off the boat, tie them all together with the rope, and they all, like a giant conga line, come down the break wall, and they make it to safety. Now, the court has been unlucky and lucky, right? It sank several times, but it's always been recovered. No one thinks this is going to be any different. There's obviously an inquiry as to, you know, was did anyone make any mistakes? Everyone is completely behind Captain Cox. They said he did everything he possibly could. This is a case of an old boat, probably underpowered, in a, in a big storm. Like there really wasn't a whole lot of options for him. And ultimately, the inquiry just rules it the perils of the sea. There was nothing that was going to stop this from happening. Uh, the owners say, we're going to salvage it, and we'll put, it, we'll put the court back into service in the spring. The day after Christmas, a new storm hits, and the Henry Court breaks in half and sinks right where she was left. The court's luck has run out. And some of her is still there. Uh, interestingly, during World War II, there was a big push to salvage as much metal from shipwrecks as they could. And so a lot of the court was salvaged for the war effort in World War II. There's still some of it down there. Uh, the very tip of her bow, that pig nose is still there. The bases of those whirling cranes are still there. And I think a boiler may still be there. But a lot of the ship was salvaged during World War II. These are the ones that sank on the Great Lakes. What's interesting about the, uh, the whalebacks is they wind up leaving the Great Lakes late in later years. So some are actually sunk off of the coast of Virginia. There's one that is off the coast of Washington. There are other whalebacks on the bottom, but these are the ones that didn't make it out of the Great Lakes. These are only the ones that sank. Now, these things were built in the late 1800s. They sailed the last one sailed up until the 1960s. So their, their main lifespan is that 1880s to 1920s, when really Great Lakes sailing was more like a contact sport. There were lots of mishaps with these whalebacks. I just, I had to include this picture. It's just way too cool, right? You just don't see a boat up on shore very often. But there were obviously a lot more mishaps than just these ones I told you about. Uh, but they were always recovered. There were other groundings. This is the South Park grounded in Lake Michigan. And I like this picture because you don't normally see photographs of this. So you have the crew up on the bow. Uh, this picture was taken by the ship that was going to take them off and rescue them. But look at the foremast. If you notice the American flag there, you'll notice that it's upside down. That is an accepted distress signal. And that is, that is old school technology. That goes back to the sailing ship days before there were radios, before there were Morse code lamps. If you were in trouble, you turned the flag upside down. And again, there's just not a lot of, uh, a lot of photographs about that. So I, I wanted to include that in there. 
and this gives you a really good view of what the deck of a whaleback looked like. I did not include this story, even though it's a pretty dramatic picture. I did not include this story because the South Park is still with us. She's now the museum ship, the Meteor in Superior, Wisconsin. I have talked about this particular boat a number of times. She actually appears in another talk that I've given here. She's one of the boats that found the wreckage of the Ira H. Owen in the 1905 storm when her name was the Frank Rockefeller. She was the steamer that was waiting for Barge 104 in Cleveland when the, when the first whaleback wreck happened. And she now serves as the last whaleback above water. There is not another whaleback anywhere in the world that you can go visit. She looks a bit different today. You notice that big white deck on her over her life. She went from hauling iron ore to hauling cars, and she ended her days as a tanker. And so you have that extra deck with all the piping for the petroleum product. But if you ever get to Superior, Wisconsin, it is a great, great museum to go visit. Um, they look actually really small, but I was shocked when you get inside there. The cabins are actually pretty large. They're, they're, it's a pretty spacious boat. So again, you can go see one, but that is the story of the steel freshwater whales, not the live ones. I'm sorry? Okay, so uh, the question is, did McDougal make money on, on this? The answer is yes, he did. Um, the whalebacks had a short lifespan, and it depends who you talk to. Some people say they weren't very successful. Some people say they were. What ultimately spelled the end for the whalebacks was the invention of new unloading equipment, the Hewlett's. Um, the, the shoreside unloading equipment was built to handle ships with their hatches set a certain way, and the whaleback design really maxed out at a little over 300 feet. I think one of them touched 400, but the design would not allow for growth with the growth of unloading equipment. But for that 20, 30 years that he was in operation, he made money. Absolutely. I'm confused over when the changeover happened from being a barge to a self-contained power ship. What And what modifications did they make other than the obvious steam engine. Well, there, there was no changeover. Some were built specifically as barges. Some were built specifically as steamers. How was the decision made that that should happen? Is it something that they're going to do anyway? Or? So that gets into, into a lot of things there. Um, basically, McDougal started building these for himself, and he needed steamers to pull them. So he started... He really didn't have to change the design very much. They just had to, um, some of the space in the stern, they started turning into an engine room instead of um, living quarters, other types of spaces. Um, but it's an interesting business model because he, he, he leased some of them to other companies, but some of them like Barge 101, him and his investors owned it. So it's like, okay, well, we need, we need a steamer to pull it and it, it gets kind of gets kind of confusing but basically back to the first question of did McDougal make money if he want he he learned pretty quick if he wanted this business venture to be successful he needed some powered vessels any other questions or am i getting out easy with two <laughs> On a barge was the the typical crew number on a barge was generally that six to nine people, depending depending on the size of the barge. So the early ones were a little over a hundred feet. By the end of by the end of uh, the eighteen hundreds, uh, they'd reached up to about three hundred feet. So somewhere in that six to nine six to nine sailor range. So the powered steamers, their crew size obviously had to be bigger because you had to have an engine crew uh, and all of that. So they were generally in that that uh, mid twenties, early low twenties. Again, kind of 
kind of depends on the size of the boat and the company too. So, okay. Ah, there we go. So if I go what screen to look at. How much time elapsed between when the tug saw the Clifton and when it was thought it went down uh, when the clock was stopped? So uh, the tug saw the Clifton at 11 o'clock in the morning on uh, September 21st. So you've got about a five hour window there that, and, and the clock being stopped at four is a rough estimate. You know, there's obviously some, some give or take there. That clock could have stopped earlier. It could have stopped later if the pilot house floated in a certain way where the, the maybe the clock didn't get submerged in the water right away, but give or take about five hours between the last sighting and, and that four o'clock time. So how did I get interested in the whalebacks? Well, I'm a nerd. So if it's Great Lakes and it floats, I'm going to learn about it. Uh, you really can't, especially uh, like the Clifton story, um, those, those boats that just go missing, they're in a bunch of different books. And then as I started studying more, more seriously, I started reading some more books about the actual, the actual you know, category of boat, if you will. Well, the internet's a wonderful thing. So, I mean, when I started, when I started researching stories, you know, I had to go to the libraries. I had to go to the archives. I have spent so many hours staring at microfilm, trying to find something I can use. But, and I am not a huge technology person, but thank God for the internet. I can now find it all. I can go around the world from my desk at my house. And at $3 a gallon of gas, that saves me a lot of money. <laughs> Another question. Roughly, yes. So the, the question is, um, you know, were the numbers on the barges indicative of when they were built? Roughly, yes. Um, but they skip numbers. So I think that's, I, and I'd have to go back and look, my guess is they're probably hull numbers. And when some of them got named, because you know, some companies, you know, maybe they couldn't keep track of all the numbers, so they gave them names. So it goes from 101, there's a 102, I think it's 101, 102, 103, 104. I think there's a 105, and then I think it skips a couple numbers. So there's gaps, but but yes, the numbers roughly. So the the very last one that was ever built actually had some changes to it. It had a more conventional bow. It had a pilot house up forward, like a traditional Laker. Um, so it depends. You know, one source I have says 44. I've read one that says 45. I've read one that says 40. So it really depends on the source and the author and what what they're considering the last whale back. Because the last couple, like I said, they they tweaked a couple things. So some sources are like, that's not truly a whale back. So that that's why I, that's why I'm giving you a range. Yeah. All of the whalebacks, yes, they were all steam power. They are all coal fired, single screw. Yep. Exactly. And and actually, the Meteor, the the uh, museum ship, is a wonderful example. If you ever get to go up there, even into the 1960s, she kept her triple expansion steam engine. And you can it, it's it's really really great technology. Um, I mean, obviously low horsepower, but. I'm always amazed at what they could, what they got steam to do. And, you know, the, the triple expansion steam engine was original steam technology. And the fact that she sailed into the 1960s with it, I think is really cool. Any other questions? Well, hey, thanks for having me back. I've kind of missed you guys.